Hello and welcome to this video on the making of my audiovisual Hinterland to the Ocean. This video shows how I go about producing audiovisual when there isn't a very strong story to retain my viewers' attention, apart from the connection between the image subject matter, of course. If you haven't seen that original audiovisual presentation, it may be a good idea to view that first. I'll link to it below. This video covers some techniques that I feel enhance the viewing experience, but without being detrimental to the presentation. I'll link below to one or two other videos that show how this audiovisual process is not such a difficult task. But generally, as with all things, the more effort we put in, the better the result. By the way, as I go through this video, I'll add other information to the screen that may not be essential for this particular video, but may be of help. As we look at my completed slideshow here in PTE AV Studio's timeline window, you may ask the question, what was my reason for making this presentation? Well, it's pretty simple, really. It's just a pleasant way to show my images to a wider audience. In addition, and if I get things right, it will also have a degree of entertainment value too. But you, the viewer, is going to be the ones who decide that. This way of displaying largely still images has been around for many years, but it's really come into its own in the digital age. It's not confined to still images, but with this presentation, still images is all I used. At first glance, what we're viewing here in the PTE AV Studio timeline window is a basic audio visual presentation. It's just a number of still images and one piece of short music, but I did use the music twice back to back. I haven't had to do any sound editing here whatsoever because none was required. All I had at the start of the process was a broad idea that I would include landscapes and seascapes and hopefully that would add some variation and possibly improve interest. Nothing more complicated than that. I had quite a number of images that I could choose from, but I don't start the process as many people do by collecting a large number of images together and sorting them into a running order. In that case, we would expect to see the file list here full of images, but at the start of the process, I don't have any at all. I select every image individually, one at a time, as the project progresses, starting with my opening title. For that, I want something appealing and stylish, because this is my first opportunity to grab the attention of my audience. So the choice of image, animation, and synchronization to the music is vital, but this is my starting point. All I have in place is one blank slide. I began by looking through my recent images in Photoshop's Bridge. I use Bridge as a browser for this process. I was looking for that image to display the title and I found this one, which was actually shot by accident. It is a skyscape but I was on a beach and as I was walking, I brushed the LCD screen with my hand. That triggered the touch controlled shutter on my camera and it fired. Now, when I saw this on my computer, I quite liked the abstract nature of it. So I edited it and saved it for future use. Let's open that up into Photoshop. By the way, I crop my images to a 16-9 aspect ratio using 3840 pixels on the long side by 2160 in height. Now that's the 4K size. It isn't essential that we do this cropping, but with my style of audio visual, I find it takes the pressure off my PC just a little bit. 
and it allows me more scope with some of the effects that I may want to give. Now I intend to publish my presentation at HD size. Now that again is 16.9, but it's 1920 pixels by 1080. So the increased size here to 38402160 is perfect for any pans and zooms that I apply. If you wanted to output your slideshow to 4K, then perhaps you should be considering the long side of your images to be 4000 pixels or even a little more. Now there's no doubt that the fashion trend within audiovisual these days is to apply some gentle movement of our still images. Now some call this the Ken Burns effect, but it's our ability to add pan, zoom and rotate, which is generally quite nice on the eye as long as it's delicate. In PTE AV Studio, I did want to add a little zoom and some rotation to this first image, but also something more. So in Photoshop, the way to do that is to make a couple of quick selections. Now let me move over and select my freehand selection tool called the lasso tool. And what I did was I made a quick selection adjust the grey cloud. Using select a mask I soften the edge of that. Something around that sort of figure is probably going to meet my needs. And then I'm going to copy what's within that selection to a new blank layer. Very easy in Photoshop Control J. Now I did exactly the same thing with a section of the base of the image as well. Something around that sort of area. And I softened the edge and copied that too. So I ended up with two other layers. If I just remove that selection for a moment and turn off the image, there you can see the cloud that I used. Now if I save this as a PNG file, then all of the transparent nature of this image, shown here by that checkerboard effect, will be retained. So I can have this base image animated within PTE AV Studio. Over the top of that, I can have this section of cloud animated slightly differently. And of course, I did it for a second time with the bottom part of the screen. Simple techniques, but they work very well. Now, let me quickly show you what I did in PTE AV Studio with my base image animation and the two sections of cloud. So as we look into the objects and animation screen of PTE AV Studio, you can see more or less what we were seeing in Photoshop. Highlighted on the right hand side, you can see the sky. And sitting over the top of that, we've got that section of grey cloud. And sitting over the top of that, or alongside that, we've got the dark cloud. Now let me take you through what I've done here. I've just selected the sky for the moment. If you look over to the left hand side, you'll see the first of the keyframes. The keyframes are like waypoints. They are where we determine where the image is at the start of the animation and the keyframe at the other end of the timeline is where the animation is going to be at the end. But if we look directly up to the top right corner, we can see that the keyframe starts with a zoom factor to or from 100% to about 120-121%. It also has a slight rotation, anti-clockwise, as you can see there, minus four. If I select the keyframe at the end of the travel, there you can see my zoom is back to 100 and the rotate is also back to zero. Now let's take a look at the grey cloud. The grey cloud is a child of the parent sky. So is the dark cloud bottom right, which means that the grey cloud will automatically take on the same animation as the sky, as will the dark cloud. But if we go to the first keyframe of that grey cloud and look up at the top right, 
you can see there's no change at all. So all it's going to do is zoom out a little bit, but it's also going to rotate along with the parent. But if I go to the final keyframe, you can see that I have actually zoomed it and I could have added, well, I've added some pan as well. I'd forgotten I'd added that. You can see a minus 52 there. And we also notice that I rotated it independently to the sky. Just gentle animation. And if we go to the dark cloud, we'll see exactly the same thing. There's the starting point. It's going to take on exactly the same animation as the sky to start with, but independently to that, I've got a pan and I've got a zoom. And if we take you to the end keyframe, there you can see the values. So how does all that come together? Well, I'm sure you've seen that in the original audio visual. But if I put my cursor at the start here and I press play, we'll be able to watch and listen to just that short section. And you'll notice that the title Hinterland to the Ocean came up right on that note change. Now I have loads of dedicated animation videos that show all of these animation techniques both on YouTube and also for download on my website. But I'll try to list as many as I can that are relevant below if you're a viewer of YouTube. Now let me close this window up at the top right and we'll go back into our slide list. Now at some stage we've got to move on to the next image and I chose this one here. Why did I choose that one? Well, if you look at it, it's very similar in colour, but because it's going to fade up from a blurred image, almost any image would work pretty well here. Now the style of transition between the images in this type of presentation needs to be a fade of one type or another. With this image selected, let me just pick up my slide options. We can set the overall dissolve using project options and that'll affect every single image in our slideshow. But we can select individuals if we want to change that. So with that one selected, let me go to my slide options. Now, generally speaking, the default transition that I've set is Dissolve, and it's going to work extremely well. But there are a couple of other options that also work very well. One of those is Shapes, which enables us to determine exactly where the image is going to fade from. We could have it fading from the center, from the bottom left corner, for example. But we need to make use of the thickness of the smoothing line. That's the softness of what you can see happening in that thumbnail. Another great option is the gates because in landscapes, we can determine whether they go top to middle, as you see in the thumbnail, or the other way around, and we've got other options too. Once again, the thickness of the smoothing line can be used to really fine tune the effect. And page is yet another one that works pretty well too. There you can see it going from corner to corner. But here I'm going to suggest probably up, down or left and right would probably be more appropriate for the sort of landscapes and seascapes that I'm using. Now the crucial areas to consider here is that any of our animation the type of animation and how much animation we're going to put into the sliders, along with the transition style and length, both of those or all of those must match the speed and tempo of our music. Now this all sounds a lot harder than it really is, but you have four major components to allow you to achieve this match between the visual and the audio. And for the most part, they're pretty foolproof. Two eyes and two ears is all we need. 
One of the best bits of advice I can offer when you're making a presentation like this is to leave what you're doing quite often and walk away. Spend an hour away from your project, two hours overnight if you can. When you do come back, the first thing you do before you do anything else is you do a full screen preview of what you have previously made. It's only by doing that over and over again that you'll start to spot the fine tuning you're going to need to make. The pan and zoom animation generally needs to be very delicate for this type of presentation. And as I've said, it must match the speed and tempo of the music. Now this does take some tender loving care to get it right, but it's rewarding work, it's creative, and therefore it's good fun to do. So how much animation is required exactly? Well, it's going to vary a little bit depending on the tempo of your music. But let's take a look at what I used in this audio visual. And the image we're looking at here is pretty typical of most of the animation that I included. I think it's a lot less than many will imagine. Remember too that PTE AV Studio does allow us to add some of these effects automatically via slide styles. I just like to do these creative parts myself. So if we select the first keyframe on the left hand side, which begins the animation, and the animation here is outwards, not inwards. If you look up at the top right, you can see the zoom factor is just 110%. When the image is first opened up, it's 100. So it's not a great deal of difference to create the effect I'm looking for. And if we go to the keyframe at the end, we can see we've just reset back to 100. Let me put my cursor back to the start once again, and I'll press play and we'll just take a look and listen. It's not very much movement at all. Another technique you would have seen in my original presentation is called the third image. As one image dissolves or fades into the next, sometimes we briefly see a third image as the two images combine. It's a technique that dates back quite a way to our film days and two projectors. Now let me show you what it is, but I'll just do this manually. So picking up the cursor in the timeline here, if I move to the right, there's the first image, there's the next image, but you quickly saw a change there. If I go back and do this slowly, you can see that between that and the other seascape, we get a combination of both. Now we can decide how long that remains on screen. And eventually, of course, we move on to the next image. So we've actually got three images used here. If I select this image and open up the objects and animation screen, you can see all three. Ignore the frame, that's just a white line around the edge. There's the main image I was talking about. This one is the one in between, which gives us our fade in. And this one is the final one. There you can see the keyframes, which move us on to the last image. Why have I put all of these within this image in the objects and animation screen? Because the base image also is animated at the same time. So I've actually got to zoom out and I've used the parent and child system here to make sure all of the images stay in register. Shall we have a quick look in Photoshop on how this is done? Because it's fairly quick and easy. I do have a dedicated video on the third image subject, so I'll link to that below. But if I turn this one off for a moment, there's the first image. There's the image we're going to see last. What we've got to do is to create the one in the middle. 
Now we've already got this one saved into the project folder and we've already got this one. So all we need to do is to select one of these and check out the blend modes. Now you can try many of these and you'll get different effects. But to speed this up, when I got down to overlay, I felt there is an image I can live with. Don't forget, you can always combine these two by flattening them together and then re-editing them. So if you combine two images and they're a little too dark, you can brighten them and vice versa. But all I would need to do now is to save this layer here combined with this one as a different image in PTE AV Studio, just giving it a different name. And that's what you saw me demonstrate just a few moments ago. As you can see, I brought you back into PTE AV Studio and into the timeline. The third image technique, which we discussed a few seconds ago between this image, this image and the one we created in between, what you'll notice here is that I've combined them with a natural pause in the music. I'm going to put my cursor at this point and I've dropped the volume of my music so hopefully I can speak over the top of it and we can hear both. But we do get the first image appear on screen and the zoom. But we get that nice change just when the music is calling for it. Now this is important synchronization. Now I've mentioned synchronizing images to music, but what does this actually mean? Well, there's going to be parts of any music that should or could trigger a slide change. Now you can see this has been done right through my audio visual from the opening image and the title of course on to the fade to black right at the end. Now this synchronization is extremely important, especially with this style of audio visual. If we look at this image as an example, if I place my cursor right on the edge when this image first starts to appear, that gray bar is telling me I've got a three second transition onto the screen and we can look down and see the peak of the music, but we'll notice that the peak is actually there. That's when the note sounds. Now you would think at first glance that something is wrong here, but visually and when we hear it, it's right. Let me put my cursor at that point and I'm gonna press play. So although I've got a little bit of what appears to be an offset here, because I've got a fairly lengthy dissolve, it takes a fraction of a second before we start to see this image. So if we ignore what's going on down here and we just look at the big picture, it looks and sounds perfect. And it's what I mean when I say we needed to be guided by our eyes and our ears. Now I've just noticed that this video has just gone past the 20 minute marker. So I'm quite conscious that I should be bringing this to a close. Just a couple of more points to make and then we'll do so. Sometimes we have to remove a very good image from our presentation. And that can be a little bit hard to do, I have to confess. And if you look at my file list here, just to the left of my cursor, you can see a couple of images there that wasn't used in the final presentation. But I intended to, and that's why they're in the holding area. This one I discarded, this one. This one I was quite keen to use, and you can see I removed the C. I don't know why I did it twice, but I must have been keen to use it, but then I didn't. But as we go down, you can see many more that I intended to use, but because they didn't fit in nicely with the images either side, I either had to move them to another location or remove them entirely and find something to take their place. Remember, take plenty of breaks away from this creative process. It'll work wonders, believe me. Save your project file with a different name so you've always got a way back to a previous version if you do something on one day that you view the next and decide you've changed your mind. It happens 
all of the time. By the time you see my final audiovisual published, I would have seen it or parts of it probably 50 times or more because it's a labour of love. But that's the way we spot the errors. I'll see you next time.